Okay. Good morning. It's December 31st, the last day of 2023 here at West Valley Grace Fellowship. Pastor David Haverd. Today I'm speaking on spiritual investments. Let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you that your sovereign hand guides everything that happens. Even though it doesn't feel like it, doesn't seem like it, or help us not to lean unto our own understanding, but unto you for all of our needs and hopes. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, now you're gonna have we're gonna start with a little audience participation. 2023 has been a heck of a year, right? So let's just all breathe in real deep. Okay. Feel better now. But how do you, when you look ahead to 2024, you know, it's that time there you pick up a newspaper or turn on the TV and there's always some person that's going to give you the, some sort of a list, you know, the top 10 list or the top 40 list of, you know, the best songs, the best movies, the worst songs, the worst movies, the biggest news headlines of the year, whatever it was. So when you think about what's coming up, are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic? Are you going, I can't wait? Are you going, look, oh, I'm dreading it. You know, so every other, like every other year, I guess that everybody comes out with not only the summary of the previous year to come out with all their predictions and prognostications. I'm trying to think what I've heard uh, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, Next year, we're going to have the worst stock market crash since 1929. I've read that a couple of times, the headline. Um, I read, well, you know, the dollar is no longer going to be the reserve currency of the world, so we're, we're gonna, it's going to be just chaos, and uh, we're going to have to go to uh, some digital currency. Um, and then every, of course, everybody, you ever notice so the person who's, the person who's talking about the catastrophe just happens to have the remedy that they'll sell you at the right price, right? Yeah. So, well, you know, the dollar is going to go kaput, the place is going to go this way, and dollar is going to go this way, so you need to invest in precious metals. I just happen to sell them. <laughs> Buy these investments, you know, you need to get out of the U.S. market. You need to get in the international market, you need to diversify your wealth. I just happen to be a broker and I can fix you up, right? Or there's going to be an EMP, electromagnetic pulse. You've read about that one probably. Mm -hmm. and it's going to just, it's, everything's going to be obliterated. It would be like living in the 1800s again. No electronics, no phones, no electrician, no nothing. Your car won't work. You need to get emergency supplies. I just happen to sell those too. So get your emergency food, water, and your solar generator at my website. So everybody's got an angle. Well, today we're going to look at some surefire, can't miss investments for 19, no, not 19, 2024. So if you open up, we're going to start with Matthew 6. And verse 19, if you want to turn there. The importance of spiritual investments. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now again, back in this time, most of their assets, they didn't have digital currency. They had precious metals and clothing. It was pretty much there two ways to show off your, your bling, right? And of course, the metals back then, the alloys were not as pure as today, so you would get canker, they would call it, in your precious metals. And of course, you're, they didn't have synthetic fabrics back then, so you had, I think you had probably linens, wools, and silks, which are all susceptible to being eaten by those little fuzzy things in your closet called moss, right? 
So that's why he says, well, we're moth and rust destroy. So those are the two things that would destroy their assets. Now we have, well, we have instead, we have market crashes and uh, currency devaluations and other things. <laughs> but the point there is the Lord is saying, well, you know, don't, don't accumulate all this wealth or who knows what's going to happen to it here on earth. So our first question would be, are your spiritual investments secure? You need to invest in something that has a proven track record. Now, one of the things they always tell you, though, these investment companies, they always have a little escape clause, right? They always say past performance does not guarantee future performance or some kind of wording like that, right? Well, we don't have to make that disclaimer with these investments because past performance, the promises of God, are an absolute guarantee of future performance. So we can invest in our heavenly bank account, if you want to call it that, and we are absolutely sure that it's even better than the FDIC out there. God does not need a bailout. You know, back when uh, the previous presidents, you remember that, that phrase, too big to fail. Well, God really is too big to fail. So invest in a proven track record, verses 19 and 20. Then in verse 21, Christ adds, Oh, by the way, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because if we believe something, we'll do it. If we don't believe it, we won't do it. So it's been said before, a person can determine what your value system is by looking at two things, your calendar and your checkbook. Where you spend your time, where you spend your money, that's the proof of what you think is important. You know, so we say, well, I certainly think, uh, I think that physical fitness is very important, but, well, this reminds me of another crazy headline. Uh, a student sued his alma mater because they would not hire him as a coach or an athletic teacher. He happened to be 400 pounds, and that's prior they wouldn't hire him as a physical fitness instructor. But anyway, you know, life is not fair. So we need to invest in spiritual things that will pass the test. So they're going to be secure. So here we have investing in the spiritual bank where we know it's secure. First off, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so importance of spiritual investments, are your investments secure? And secondly, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Will your investments pass the audit? Now, you know, we have the Federal <coughs> Securities Commission, and they invest all these dodgy schemes. Well, how we've invested will be audited too someday. 2 Corinthians <coughs> Chapter 5, verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So this is kind of saying, well, how, how have you invested the assets that God has given you? So we're going to stand before him, and each one, as a steward, we're going to give an account, and he's going to say, yeah, that was a good investment. No, that wasn't a good investment. And if you have, if you... If your investment was good, shall we say you'll get a dividend, to use another word for reward. And if you had an investment that didn't perform, guess what? You get no return on that investment. So how are you investing your time and your talents for the Lord? If you go back one book to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, are you taking your investing seriously? Now again, the, the proof of this is in, your, in our actions, right? We can say, oh yeah, I, I'm, really, I'm really concerned about uh, doing that, but if we take no action, kind of like it says in the book of James, you know, well, faith without works is useless, it's dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul says, Do you not know, again, it's kind of a, 
hello, don't you know that those who run in a race all run? He's probably here thinking of like the uh, you know, Olympic game or something like that. So everybody's running, but one receives a prize. Everybody runs a race, but there's only one winner. You know, you go to even any race, you know, stock cars, F1, whatever it is, they're all going around the track, they're all running, they're racing. We only, if you're racing, only one guy gets the checkered flag, right? Only one comes in first. And Paul says, well, don't you know they all run, but only one gets the prize. So run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now, how, how silly would it be for a race driver or a runner, you know, the starting gun goes <coughs> off, you, you just kind of put, 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 putting around the track, you know, like you're driving a golf cart or something. Everybody's lapping you. Oh, I don't care. I'm just, why are you on the track? Didn't you get out here to win? So he says, well, run in such a way that you may obtain it, meaning the prize. For everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Again, our crown is not going to be corrupted by rust and moss and eaten up by who knows what. So he says, therefore I run thus. This is the way I run, not with uncertainty. I'm not just kind of aimless, you know, don't know where I'm going. It says, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. I'm not just shadow boxing or hitting at shadows. It says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So again, we need to invest in things that are going to last and make sure that our investments are gonna pass the test and then take it seriously. Otherwise, you know, why bother? So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at the proper mindset for investing. Hebrews chapter 12, first couple of verses. So he follows, of course, chapter 12, you know, follows that famous chapter 11, which is the great, you know, heroes of faith chapter. And so he says, therefore, verse 1 of chapter 12, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So the witnesses in verse 1, I don't some people, oh, that means all the people who went before us, they're sitting up in heaven looking down on us. You know, they're watching everything we do. I don't know, that's not what it's saying. It's referring back to the witnesses, those who witnessed to their faith back in chapter 11. So he's saying, well, look, based on all those fine examples of living by faith, we should do these things. So he first he talks about lay aside. If you go over to Romans chapter 13, we're going to link some verses up here. Uh, Romans 13 and verse 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So that has that same wording. So it has the idea of to not just to leave, you know, like. Um, there's two ways to take something off and put something on, right? This has to do to throw off with urgency. So it's not like uh, you get up in the morning and it's your day off, so you just eventually get dressed. This is more like it's a work day 
and the alarm didn't go off, and all of a sudden you wake up with a start, and it's after nine o'clock, you should have been at work at eight. So you're, you're throwing off your bed clothes, right? You're not just leisurely doing it, you're, you're throwing it off. There's urgency to how you're doing that. And that's the idea here. Or it's the picture of, say someone, you're, you're on the shore of a lake or the ocean or whatever, and someone's drowning, and you're kind of going to get them, so you're, you're getting off your outer clothing as quick as you can to get the water and rescue them. Throwing, so the idea here is throwing off with urgency something that's going to drag you down. And that's the picture that uh, the writer of Hebrews is using. We talks about, let us lay aside. So the lay aside there has to do with I mean, doing it now, getting, getting rid of it like, you know, quickly. I should just keep my finger there, I guess, in Hebrews. So I won't be doing that again. So then he says, well, lay aside... Quickly, any weight. Now, weight, uh, what do we throw off? Is it any hindrance, distraction, anxiety? And then the original has the idea of, like when one guy translated it, uh, it has to do with bulk. I mean, one guy translated a swelling of superfluous flesh. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're in, kind of the idea is we're in training and we need to lose weight. You know, to get you need to get your fighting weight if you're a boxer or something like that. Uh, we need to take off any trailing garment that's going to trip you up. Reduce the drag. They were like those competitive swimmers, and I can't remember when it was when the guys finally started actually doing the whole body shaving to reduce drag. I'm like, okay, that's TMI. I don't, you know, that's you're really going to save that much time off your swim by anyway. So we need to reduce our drag. And so we could run quickly. And if you keep your finger in Hebrew, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 12, Paul says, now remember, and Paul often dealt with this, right? People would ask Paul, I'll try, I'm going to reword it, but basically they're asking Paul, how much can I get away with before it becomes sin? That was kind of what their attitude was, right? Especially in Corinth. Well, you know, like, how, you know, like you tell your kid, don't, don't go, how close can I put my toe without actually crossing the line? And how, how, like when you watch football, you know, they do the replay. Well, was he inbounds or out of bounds when he caught the ball? So we're going to do a slow motion replay. Okay, he was, he was right up to the edge of that little painted white line, but he didn't cross it, so he's all right. Or they review it. Well, yeah, he, he was out of bounds. The play's no good. Bring it back. So here Paul says, well, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. Yeah. All things are lawful for me, but I would not be brought under the power of any. He talks about food for the stomachs and things. So um, there are certain things we can do. Are they wrong? No, not necessarily. Are they good the kind of those neutral things you know it's like some things aren't bad in themselves you know certain hobbies uh you know sports whatever it is but when that becomes i don't know, like paul says uh i will not be brought under the power of any i would not be addicted to anything i would not be where that's controlling my life you know so if we once you become obsessed with something to use that word then it's probably not a good thing, right? Whether it's, I like to golf, or I like to bowl, or I like to do whatever it is. Once you get to the point where you're like the teenager in the bedroom playing the video game for 16 hours a day, it's probably not healthy at that point, right? So it's not good versus evil, but more like neutral versus beneficial. So anything that's gonna distract you, or you know, like I could, if you're in training, you know, can you grab that? Name your favorite candy bar at the checkout line. Can you grab that and eat it? Absolutely. Is it probably going to be good for you? <laughs> probably not. And this is the bad time of year for that, right? Because most people give you for Christmas. I'm like, oh, my house is like, hey, it's Christmas time. Here's a box of chocolates. Hey, it's Christmas time. Here's a box of treats I baked for you. Hey, it's Christmas time. Which, you know. I had to find a little pair of pants to put on more this morning because the ones I was going to put on, 
there was a gap about this far between where the snap and the latch was going, right? So my weight hasn't changed, but apparently it's migrated something. So <laughs> TMI, I know, but uh, I blame it on the Christmas tree. So it's all my neighbor's faults and all them people, you know. So I, I didn't, I didn't mind my own business here. Verse twelve. Um, well, anyway, we need to lay these things aside, lay aside any weight, and then it says, so weight would be something that's not necessarily sin, but it can be detrimental. But then he goes from what may or may not be bad to what, well, really is bad. And he says, and lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So, obviously, we need to get rid of that. Um, kind of like, you know, what You've seen in the movies where the ship's getting in some rough sea. What do you know? Throw away anything we don't need, throw it overboard, right? And this has the idea of it in snares, it's like a you know, like a robe around your ankles or, or whatever. Um, 2 Timothy 2.26, where that word that word is word is used again, 2 Timothy 2.26 says. Paul is here, he's talking about how the teachers of the word need to be gentle. And he says and that they, mean those who need to be corrected, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Again, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities and powers and rules of darkness, high places. So he says, well, we need to do this so they can escape the snare of the devil. And it reminds me, you remember in the, what was it, Jason and the Argonauts, right? And they had to tie themselves to the mast of the ship because they're sailing past that island of the sirens. We were going to be calling out to them and they'd crash upon the rocks and trying to get to them or whatever. So we don't want our ship of faith to be shipwrecked upon the reef of sin. So don't, uh, don't be ensnared by it. And, you know, again, Satan is giving his due. As I say, give the devil his due. Um, he's a good he's a good fisherman, right? He he knows what lure each one of us are going to bite at. You know he knows all that. You know David won't bite at that. He'll bite at this one, but the one I won't bite at might be the one that you'll bite at. He knows. So back to Hebrews, we need to lay aside every weight and the sin. Again, it so easily ensnares us. I think Paul talked about that in Romans, right? Romans 7. The things I want to do, I don't, that's what I'm doing. The things that I really want to do, I'm not doing. The sin easily ensnares us. We still have that sin nature. He said, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So endurance, the King James says, run with patience. And they're both kind of, the flip sides of the same coin, right? Because here it's, it's talking about both. This word means both passive endurance and active persistence. So it's not, it's, it's, it's kind of both. So again, we're not, the, the Christian life is a, you probably heard it said, it's not a sprint, right? It's a marathon. And a lot of times, you know, we, when someone starts a marathon, someone <coughs> just start off really fast. And I was like, no, no, you, you really need to pace yourself. It's a long race. It's not just a 100-yard dash. So, if we go back to Romans chapter 8, and verse 24, in verse 23, he's talking how we were eagerly awaiting for our adoption, and we are, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Kind of reminds you of Hebrews 11, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So Paul here echoes that. For hope that is seen, well, that's not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So... And actually, this Romans 8 passage in the verse uh, 19, 23, and 25, that same phrase, eagerly wait. So 
We do not lose hope, and we don't give up. And again, one reason is, if you are expecting a sprint and find yourself in a marathon, you're going to get discouraged. I mean, I thought this would be over by now. What, what's going on here? Well, you were told the wrong thing. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Pace yourself. You need some endurance. But the good news is, if you turn over to Colossians 1, chapter 11, the good news is, God will give you the endurance. God will give you the patience to do it. He says in verse uh, 11, he says, Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Now notice it says, pay attention to the little words here. We're strengthened with how much might? All might. Not like, oh, we'll give you a smidgen. No, we have all we need. Because it's, the reason we're strengthened with all might is because it's according to his glorious power. Now it says according to, not out of. There's a big difference, right? If, uh, if I gave you out of my wealth, that would be, could be a nickel. It just came out of my wealth. If I give you according to my wealth, it, well, probably a hundred bucks. Now, like if Humphreys gave you out of his wealth, it could be a nickel, but he gave you according to, it probably be 10 grand, right? So God here is saying, the reason we are strengthened with all might, it's according to, it's proportional to God's glorious power. And that will give us all patience and long suffering. And then the last part of that verse says, not only will God give us patience and long suffering, two sides of the same coin, he'll give it to us with joy. So we're, we're able to go through it and still have joy. And 2 Thessalonians 1 4, we won't turn there, but our endurance will encourage other believers. So back to Hebrews, we're setting aside everything that easily ensnares us. We need to run with endurance, the race that is set before us. And that has the idea, it's, it's a course laid out for you. And it's a custom-made course, according to the Greek. It's marked out just for you. You can't run someone else's race, right? What's the current phrase now? You do you, baby. You just do you. Well, we do have a custom-made course that we need to run. If you go to John 21, 21, 21, I go to reference because it's easy to remember. Now, Peter exhibits, Peter exhibits human nature perfectly, right? We do the same thing. So, this is after uh, Christ asked Peter, do you love me? And our English translations, you know, kind of cover that up, right? Because God asks, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Peter, do you? And so then he finally says, do you even phileo me? So, Lord, you know. Anyway. Um, so, he tells Peter how he's going to die, and what's Peter's response? Um, <coughs> verse 21, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about him? What about this man, right? And probably speaking to John, so anyway, God says to Peter, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? It's not... Okay, this, can we translate that? God tells Peter what's going to happen to him. Peter don't like that. Say, well, what's going to happen to him? It's none of your business. You worry about you, right? So, God in his sovereignty, I hope someday we'll understand that he'll give us an answer. He may not. But you look at things, the old saying, why do bad things happen to good people? You look at some people... They kind of go through life just a charmed existence, right? Yeah. You look at other believers, 
and it's just one thing after another. One catastrophe, one heartache, one what, it's just bam, 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 bam. You're like, why is that this person has an easy street from A to Z, and this person just never catches a break? I don't know. God knows. But the point is, we're like Peter. We're, we're looking at us on our, our bumpy road, and we're looking at some other person who's on their perfectly paved, no bump road, and we go, God, how come this road is so much smoother than mine? What's God's answer? <laughs> it's none of your business. You just stay on your road, and you do what I've told you to do. So, let's worry about ourselves. And then it says, while we're running this race, and it's, it's a continuous present tense verb, while we're running our race, we need to be continually looking unto Jesus. So, keep your focus. Um, again, using the illustration, I went to motor school in the police department. Their, their mantra, head and eyes, head and eyes. You look at where you want to go, not at what you're trying to not go. You know, if you're trying to go, look at, focus where you're trying to go, not be looking what you're trying not to hit. Okay, something like that. Because sure enough, you'd be going through that cone course or whatever, and they'd have them laid up really good. If you, as long as you focus where you're going, you, you do it. But if you glance, even for just a millisecond, at the cone you weren't supposed to hit, guess what? You hit it. Every time. It was amazing to me. So uh, they kicked some. Pound it in your head, head and eyes, head and eyes. Same thing for us. We need to be looking unto Jesus, looking unto, focusing on where we're, where we're going. Remember when I was in basic training, the drill sergeant said, because uh, people have a tendency to walk around like this, right? He cuts us out. What the blanky blank you looking down for? There's nothing to see down there. Look out, keep your eyes out. Look where you're walking. The truth of that, kind of like when you're driving, right? Just looking at the front of the front of the hood, you're not really seeing what's coming down the road, right? But you can try this trick when you get home. If you look down the road, your peripheral vision will catch anything. I see this. I'm focused on that back wall, the little picture. I'm sick in there, but I still see this. Your peripheral takes care of that. If I'm just looking here, I don't see what's going on. So we need to keep our focus on him. And Romans 8, 5 talks about we need, oh, I'll go there. So there's a positive and a negative aspect of this, right? We need to not look at, not focus on the things we don't want. And we need to positively focus on what we do want. So it's a negative and a positive thing. So you know, negatively, it's like, some of you may have grew up on a farm where you had the, the plow horse, you had the blinders on him, right? What was that for? You weren't supposed to get spooked or distracted by what was going, he, he was just, he was supposed to focus on the role in front of him. And sometimes we kind of, we kind of need that. And Romans 8, 5, Paul kind of sums this up. He says, for those who live according to the flesh, big surprise, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. So it's all about, again, it's that mindset. What are we setting our mind on? So another illustration uh, back to the farm. I don't know if you guys had, ever had to run a tractor with a plow or a disc on it. And if you weren't looking far out, you didn't have a set point. Once you got to the end and looked back, your role was looked like a drunk blind man had done it, right? It was all over the place. You had to pick, you had to pick a focus point and look at that and just keep straight on to it. Same way if you're sailing, you've been sailing, you gotta you know, tack back and forth or whatever, or you're, you're just driving a boat. You wanna pick something across the lake or something that's fixed to be aiming for. If you're just looking at the water, you're, you could be going in a circle for all you know, right? 
So we don't want to be short-sighted. We want to have a focus, a heavenly focus, that will enable us to plow a straight road. So we need to be laying aside all these things. We need to be focusing properly. And then we need to be keeping our focus on Jesus Christ, who happens to be the author and finisher of our faith. I didn't keep my finger in our cup, Mr. So, the word finisher, by the way, if you're a word guy, this is the only place that word's used in the New Testament. Finisher. Teleotes. We heard teleos, finish, end. <coughs> so, he starts our faith, right? He began it all, and he will bring it to perfect completion. We're not going to do it, but he will, and that's a promise. Colossians 1.28 uh, says, Him we preach, speaking about Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, and the word that, that's your purpose clause, so that we may present every man Perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, positionally, right now, we are perfect in Christ Jesus. But there's going to come a day when that positional perfection is going to be practical perfection. When we see him, how's that word verse go? Uh, we're going to be like him when we see him, is it John? So, we look forward to that, right? Someday it's not just going to be kind of technical perfection or judicial perfection. It's going to be practical perfection. We are going to be complete. We're going to be perfected in Christ in that day. So we look forward to that. And it all begins and ends with him. Those verses, Revelation uh, 1.8 and 22 or 13, you, you'll know them. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. So from Genesis 1-1, Revelation 22-21, it's all about God, right? In the beginning, God created. Some have said, well, you know, Genesis is the book of paradise lost, to quote Milton. Revelation is going to be paradise restored. And you, it, it's, it's, it's nice to know how the story ends, right? And especially to know that we're on the winning side. So finally, we are, we're running our race, we're keeping our focus on the Lord where it belongs, not on the earth and not on all those things that trip us up. And our example is Christ. He's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. So, again, he's our example. We consider him. Look, well, look at what the Lord went through. But uh, just I'm going to point out for the joy. Now, I will suggest that that would be better translated as instead of, not for. Christ was not motivated to go to the cross and accomplish the will of God and salvation because he was going to get a charge out of it. He was going to get a joy out of it. If you think about it, Christ was pre-existent with God for all eternity, right? Before he came to earth. He was in perfect, what's the word they use? Felicity. He was in perfect happiness with God the Father <clears throat> in, before time began. I don't know how long that was, but eons probably. He coexisted in complete happiness with God the Father. Instead of all that, instead of that perfectness and you know utopia, <coughs> whatever. Instead of that, he set that aside and came to earth in the form of Christ, the child, and became our Savior. So that was not his 
motivation, but that's talking about what he, what he gave up to come down to earth to be our Savior. 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 3. Here Paul's talking to Timothy, and he says, You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one entangled in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Then he goes back to the athletic analogy again. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So, instead of sitting on his easy chair, so to speak, Christ came to earth. So, instead, so if we used our paraphrasing here, so instead of the easy chair present here with us right now, we need to get up, out of it, and be in training and start running the course that God's laid out for us. Now, it's not an easy race to run. No one's going to try to kid us about that. John chapter 16. Again, you find these principles throughout every dispensation, right? God's people have suffered persecution in every dispensation. But God's presence has also been with them in every dispensation. John uh, 16.33. Now, are we going to go through the Great Tribulation? Absolutely not. We're going to be rescued. But can things get pretty bad before we're raptured out of here? Yes. Yeah, so look at 2023. Just look at, look, look at the downward trend and what's becoming open hostility to Christians. And to anything that smacks of God or right and wrong. Verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Christ says, I've spoken these things to you so you can have peace. Right? And all of the mayhem that's going on around us, right? We look to God and that gives us peace. Or it should. So, Now notice he says, you're not going to have peace in the world. Our peace is found in him, right? In cases of James, talks about um, rejoice when you come into various tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience. So we're, we're not rejoicing in the tribulation. We're rejoicing in what God is doing through that. Same thing here. In Christ, in God, we have peace. And it's, it's a peace that the world can't understand, as it says in Philippians. It's the peace that passes all understanding, right? We should be losing our mind, theoretically speaking, right? Just the world is literally going to hell in a handbasket. We should be pulling our hair out what's left of it. But and then how, how can you be so calm? I know who's in control. I know where my future is. I know where my investments are. And, do I like it? No. But am I worried about it? No. I'm not. How can you be that way? Don't you care? Yeah, but I just care about different things. I never got my peace and happiness from things that aren't going to last in this world. During the Proverbs, it talks about don't strive to be rich because you cast the glance at riches and they're gone. I'm <coughs> paraphrasing it. Or, or, or it talks about another proverb how Money like grows wings like an eagle and flies away. Yeah, that's true. It's always amazing how you can it takes you so much longer to earn it than it does to spend it or lose it, right? So in the world, you will have tribulation. So don't be surprised about it. It's gonna happen. It's not some strange thing. Could be a good year. Why? I've overcome the world. Right? Kind of reminds me when he t told Peter, when he referred to himself, he was playing words there between rock and stone, and oh, on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell what, will not prevail against it, and I'll overcome it. So, and it's not, 
He doesn't say, I will overcome the world, right? He says, I have. It's, in God's mind, it, it's a done deal. Like our salvation, it's a done deal. We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Christ has overcome the world. He, he's already victorious over it. So that's why we have joy and we know that him. So we need to consider him, not our circumstances. For, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 17. Now I'm always amazed that Paul, well, let me go back to verse 16 in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. If anybody had a reason to lose heart, right, it was Paul. Remember when he goes about, well, if you want, if you want proof of my apostleship, he just lists off all these things, right, that he went through and suffered. He says, well, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The older you get, the truer that is, right? Mm -hmm. Then know what he says. For our light <coughs> affliction. Wait a minute. Paul? Oh, that's just... It's, remember, well, not to get sacrilegious, but you don't have to raise your hand, but some of you may have watched Monty Python in the search for the Holy Grail years ago. You got the Black Knight, right? It's just, it's merely the flesh wound, or he says. Pure Paul is like, oh, it's just a light affliction. And what's more, it's but for a moment. Well, you know, and every year goes by faster than the previous year, right? Mm -hmm. When you look in the mirror, are you surprised at the reflection? Who is this person? I still feel like I'm 17 inside. Well, Lord, how did it happen so quick? We look back in light of eternity. It's, I mean, it's a moment. And all the analogy of Scripture, what is your life? It's just a vapor. It's like the flower. It's like the grass. It comes up and it withers. It's all, in, it's all gone one day. Well, our light affliction, it's only for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So you got the contrast of light, temporary, contrasted with heavy and eternal. Eternal weight of glory. While, so here's the meanwhile, here we are in verse 18. While this is going on, we do not look, remember, it says in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's probably one of the, no. That could be said to be one of the deepest blow your mind verses in scripture if you really want to think about it. Everything you can see is temporary. Everything in this room, we're all temporary. These bodies aren't forever, thank God. The more they fall apart. What we cannot see, each of our souls. That's the, that's the only thing in this room right now that's eternal is our soul. So we need to consider him that says, lest you become weary and discouraged. Galatians 6, 9 says, be not weary in well-doing, for we all shall reap if we don't faint. Now, I probably quoted that wrong. But the point is, well, you know, like, going back to investments, what do they say? Don't try to time the market because you're not going to get it right. Don't try to time the spiritual market. Don't pull your investment out when it's the wrong time. So wrong focus will lead to discouragement. If we start thinking that all this stuff here is what it's all about, and we see all that stuff vaporizing and going away, yeah, we're going to get discouraged. So to conclude, each one of us, we need to decide what's really important. What well, we just read in Romans, that... Everything important is stuff you can't see. If you can see it, 
not really important. So we evaluate what you're doing now. We need to evaluate where, where are we investing. And if we go back to Romans, if we're investing in anything that we can see, touch, taste, handle, <clears throat> it's not an eternal investment. So then we need to make needed course corrections. Just like if you're out in a sailboat and you're tacking around or whatever and you're like, oh, I'm starting to drift. Nudge that rudder, get back on the tack you're supposed to be. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the encouragement that it gives us in these unstable times. I thank you that we can trust and we can rest and we can have peace in knowing that we have a secure future in you because of all you've done for us. And despite all the craziness of this world, we can have peace in our heart with patience as we give glory to you. In your name we pray.